Um, my name is uh, Dr. Christopher Hawkins. I'm a staff member with the Western Pacific Fishery Management Council. Uh, I'm a social scientist at the council, so my primary duty at the council is to ensure that the um, people, the people part of the equation, are adequately considered when we're developing policies and plans for managing fisheries. And so several of the fishery management councils, there's eight of them in the country, now have social scientists like me in addition to biologists and uh, fishery management types that have historically been a part of the council. Uh, and just briefly, for those of you who are listening in and, and folks here in our audience uh, here on site, uh, just a little bit of background information about the Fishery Management Council system, if you don't already know. But the council system was established in 1976 by Congress. There are eight regional councils. So basically what Congress decided in the mid-1970s was that the management of federal fishery resources, again, three to 200 miles federal waters, um, should be broken down into local units so that it wasn't all coming from Washington, D.C. Um, it was uh, deemed better to have a lot more local uh, participation, both uh, public and resource managers and politicians and the management of regional fisheries than just having um, Congress or the, uh, you know, the, the National Marine Fisheries Service in Washington, D.C. be dictating all of the management of resources from Maine to Guam. And so there are eight councils. Each council has an executive director and a staff, and they're made up of um, voting and non-voting council members from the various uh, state and territorial fishery management agencies um, and fishing industry and even environmentalists and others. They all sit on the council. I think our council has 16 or 17 total. Not all of those are voting members. So the law requires some voting members and some non-voting members. And what they do is they uh, they they guide federal policy when it comes to fishery management. Maybe something's going on with the stock that we need to jump in and change an annual catch limit or the way that gear is deployed and, and all of that. So the council staff in concert with the National Marine Fisheries Service does a lot of analysis. The council itself votes on perhaps the best direction to go for the change and then sends that a vote and that recommendation to the National Marine Fisheries Service. And, um, most, most off, more often than not, much more often than not, the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, takes that advice and it becomes, you know, through a process, it becomes regulation and law um, down the road. So that's what the Fishery Management Council does. Uh, the video that we're presenting today is um, based on some fairly recent research that's been done here in the Hawaiian Islands, some tagging research. Um, and some, you know, sort of an understanding of the local culture and perspective when it comes to yellowfin tuna and what we're um, potentially seeing, there's some indication that not um, all of the yellowfin that we think are uh, highly migratory are as highly migratory as, as we may have once thought. There's some indication that they are, in fact, some of them are, in fact, more residential. They stick around the neighborhood, so to speak, here in Hawaii. And that has implications for how we might um, want to manage them going forward as a sort of a quote-unquote local stock. Um, the science is still out a bit on this, but it, it, there are indications and suggestions, like I said, pointing us in this direction. So the council produced this video to try to get a little more into the public consciousness, um, this concept of sort of local stewardship of what may be more of a local stock than we once thought. And so with that, I think we can, we can hit play on the video. It's, um, I think you'll find it to be an interesting video uh, and hopefully it'll stimulate some questions and hopefully I'll have the answers to those questions afterwards. But if not, I uh, certainly uh, can get the answers for you either through uh, Hanawa Bay and Sea Grant or you know, calling the council or, or whatnot. So um, I hope you enjoy the video and um, here we go. Fishing, you have to appreciate, is the last great organized hunting activity on Earth. We don't hunt for meat in general anymore. Sure, there's lots of hunting that goes on, but the main supply of meat to people in the United States and elsewhere in the world comes from agriculture, from livestock. In fishing, the yes, there is marine aquaculture and freshwater agriculture, but still, the biggest supply of marine fish and seafood products come from wild-caught animals. So it's the last great hunting activity on Earth. The elephant is a very important pelagic fish species here in Hawaii. Big guy, and yes, that's probably the most important tuna, but yellowfin certainly is number two. Yellowfin tuna um, 
outside of Kona is probably the premier fish that most people pursue, uh, especially during the summertime when we have the larger classes of yellowfin tuna. A good example is last year's Ahi Fever Fishing Tournament, which is the largest fishing tournament in the state of Hawaii, held off of Waianae. If you didn't have a fish that was more than 250 pounds, you didn't even place in the, in the winner's brackets. Yellowfin has always been important to not just the canneries that we used to have here, but it's very important to the recreational fishermen and our, our subsistence fishery as well. In terms of the rest of the United States, Hawaii ranks seven in terms of recreational fishing. And for our, our commercial fleet, we are within the top 10 of U.S. ports that are valued. People used to have this mentality in the world that with tuna, well, why should I conserve this tuna? Because tomorrow it's going to cross the ocean. But if you believe and know that your fish don't leave you, well, that's, that's a whole different concept. Less than 3% of our fish ends up on foreign soil. It's primarily a domestic market. We are part of the United States. There are other people on the mainland who certainly come to appreciate the benefits of, of eating fish, as well as have begun to understand and appreciate poke, sashimi, sushi, and so forth. The Hawaii fleet, we represent almost 25% of the yellowfin that domestically caught. So this fishery represents a significant amount of fish, not only for Hawaii, but for the, the rest of the nation as well. I like to eat fish a lot. I like to eat fish in different preparations, raw, cooked, halfway cooked. In general, the yellowfin tuna, as opposed to the big eye tuna, will be more darker crimson red. The flesh will definitely be firmer. It'll have like a nice crunch to the meat. We usually choose the yellowfin over big eye for a poke uh, type of preparation, just due to the fact that, you know, once you cut it up and you put it into a bowl and you're going to be mixing it, a lot it's going to be handled a lot some of the softer fish will tend to kind of mush which you, you know if you're eating poke you don't want to have a bowl of mushy fish so that the, the the yellowfin will lend itself great to a poke application and your big eye tuna you're typically going to see the, the fatty part of the fish more towards the belly on the yellowfin tuna you're going to actually see when it does have the fat the fat will actually go through the majority part of the flesh, not just the belly part. So even then, in that respect, it lends itself great to the poke, where even though you're cutting it up, each each piece will taste really good. Stronger and stronger evidence is coming forward that the more fish you eat, the better you are for cardiovascular health, heart health, and also brain health and function. There are obviously concerns about mercury, and uh, mercury is known as a neurotoxin. There is stronger and stronger evidence that when we look at the mercury issue right now, we're only looking at a single um, element and not looking at the whole package of, of nutrients that are in there. Now, selenium is an essential mineral. We need to have that in our body. So the relationship here between mercury and selenium is that chemically, those two have such a great, strong, binding affinity. If they are in the same system, they will seek each other out. That's called chelation. When you binding that mineral, it is no longer biologically available. In experimental diets that have been fed to animals that have an excess of mercury over selenium in the diet, there is profound mercury toxicity. The same level of mercury with an excess of selenium and the animals, are they thrive. They're perfectly fine. Now there is more and more strong evidence that it's the ratios of mercury and selenium in the diet that are most important in uh, determining risk, not just the mercury alone. Tunas, they provide not only the omega-3 fatty acids, but they also provide selenium in excess of the mercury content. Well, our day is like a two to three day trip. Um, if we're full-time commercial fishermen, we make 100% of our livelihood from fishing, um, whether it be pelagic fishing or bottom fishing. Um, I generally specialize in bottom fishing for the deep seven here in Hawaii. Well, I fish pretty much exclusively for mama's fish also in Maui. 
Um, we do have three other wholesalers on the island, which takes a large chunk of the yellowfin and big eye that comes from um, our console fats that we have. Um, our fats are specifically designed for big eye tuna and yellowfin and it's doing their job just fine. I mean, it's been probably the most productive fads in Hawaii for the last four to five years. When it's on, it's on. It's, and when it's off, it's off. It's like a light switch, you know? If one day you be there, it'll be biting. The next day you go, you won't catch anything, you know? It's that, it, it, it's that. It's, it's just a water temperature thing or a current thing or, you know, just the food might have left and then they're done, you know? They're, they're not there. And then you wait a day or two and then they'll come back, you know? It's because, these fish are like, you know, they're migrating everywhere. They're following the food. I was conducting research for the Project Fisheries Research Program. And I was curious about the tuna here because I just come from a region where the majority of the tuna in the world reside, which is that big area between New Guinea and Micronesia, Philippines, over to Kiribati. Uh, That's where more than half of the world's tuna um, comes from. And up here in Hawaii, we had tuna too, but I was just curious, where do our tuna come from? We assume that they probably come from the equator, and some are born locally, and we have a good influx of fish coming in, etc. And that, uh, but that's all assumption. So that's the first study I did actually for the Pelagic Fisheries Research Program, it was a big study on yellowfin reproductive biology. These animals are really amazing. They're so fast growing and they mature very, very quickly. Mature yellowfin tuna, the females will put out between like three and eight million eggs per night, night after night after night, repeatedly for weeks and at a time. And, um, and they'll be doing that after they're only about two and a half years old. Here we have a long spawning season for yellowfin, pretty much from April until October during the warmer water months. In Hawaii, it, it's kind of an interesting situation because every summer we get these runs, and and those are spawning aggregations of you know the big yellowfin, and and you see all of the guys going out there and catching them, and and those fish spawn, drop their eggs, and and you know the eggs are caught in the local currents and and drift around for a while. So they're fast growing, they reproduce a lot. We have a good spawning season of them here, but. One of the questions that we always ask in tuna science is, how is our population of tuna that we have here connected to the broader Pacific, the Eastern Pacific, the uh, equatorial regions? That is, how much can we depend on the population to be repopulated from that sink population, or how independent is it? And none of that was really known at that time. Our next big project that got involved in was with uh, Dr. Kim Holland, the Hawaii Tuna Tagging Project. And that was a great experiment. These are simple dart tags. They're plastic tags that are put into the back of a tuna. It has a number on it. You measure how long it is. You let it go. Then in your database, you know the species, the length, what the day you let it go. And then when fishermen capture it, there's a reward for the return of that tag. Then you get the information on where it was caught. Very simple technology, but it's still one of the best ways we have of understanding what we're going to do. We tagged 8,000 yellowfin tuna and 8,000 big eye tuna. Then you just let the experiment run and see where they get caught. What was intriguing was that out of all those thousands of yellowfin tuna, most of them tagged within the main Hawaiian Islands, basically from Kauai to the Big Island and neighboring seamount in the south of us. Of all those thousands of yellowfin tuna throughout the whole span of the project and throughout their lifespan, they were only caught in Hawaiian waters. And this is not only true for Hawaii, but they're finding out off of the coast of Mexico too, that yellowfin in particular have an affinity to where they were born. So the histology of the fish, um, through the, you know, studying the otolith, there's some chemical markers in there that says this fish was born in these waters and, and when we catch them and we give those little lists to the science center and they look and says, oh yeah, this is a local fish. Because that tells you that local spawning of yellowfin here in Hawaii contributes a vast amount of fish of our population to our local fisheries. 
The elephant tuna seem to stay in this region. They mature quickly. They start spawning. Their young will grow up and probably remain in this region and also contribute to that population. Then again, studies we've done with that large tagging project were able to develop um, size-specific natural mortality estimates for yellowfin tuna and big eye here. And surprisingly, the natural mortality levels dropped very low to their minimum at about 10 pounds. So after 10 pounds or so, what that tells you is that that fish has a very good chance of surviving in the wild. The tunas mature over a kind of a size range. So there's not just this point where they all start spawning. For yellowfin tuna in Hawaii, the size ranges from about 35 to 100 pounds. We use a length-based figure. So generally, most of the fish mature at about 112 centimeters, about 44 inches, when we estimate that half the population is spawning. And that occurs uh, somewhere between two and two and a half years of age. So it's quite, quite young and uh, the growth to that period is, is rapid. This is one reason why when you look at different tunas, some are doing better than others as far as exploitation, because uh, fast, obviously a fast maturing fish will do better. About 10 years ago, there was an initiative in the legislature to take a look at placing some minimum sizes on both yellowfin tuna and aqua or skipjack tuna. Uh, through the legislative process, uh, basically fishermen who were uh, thinking about sustainable practices um, wanted a minimum size for both species. Uh, the other side lined up in opposition to the bill. Uh, they were basically the aqua boat industry at the time, which had more boats operating, as well as the uh, retailers and uh, wholesalers. So I believe what happened in, in sort of a compromise, which usually occurs in the legislative process, um, yellowfin tuna was assigned a three pound minimum and aku uh, was not assigned any minimum right now. So for home consumption, it's important to know, you can consume an aku of any size, you can consume a yellowfin tuna of any size. You just can't sell a yellowfin tuna that is less than three pounds. There were no studies done at that time there was no scientific evidence there was no justification or uh, real reason to, to regulate at three pounds it has nothing to do with the size of maturity or the size of anything really it was a holdover of the someone's desire to initially regulate skipjack um, to ensure sustainable fishing for the yellowfin that there needs to be a change in the rule? There's been some discussion about old laws, if they're not appropriate, get rid of them, revise them. It's been a, um, a long-standing debate within the state what to do with this law. A commercial fisherman like myself, I support, you know, raising it. Um, and I know I consulted with a few people on the island before we got to this point, and 90% of it, they, they want it raised. They, they, they all believe that three pounds is a little too small. And on the enforcement side, they, they discuss that it's hard to tell what a two and a half or two and three quarter pound fish sitting side by side with a three pound fish. So it's hard to distinctly tell which one's legal and which one's not. And I think with the raising of the size limit, I think that'll help them quite a bit as well. The three pound size and a 10 pound size or seven pound size, it's pretty much the same usage, but it's not necessarily more poking, but more like frying or, you know, soups or things like that. The three pound size, three, four, five pounds are a lot easier to sell than the five, six, seven, eight pounders. Um, just because it's, it's a more usable size for, for any family. It, it will affect how much we can sell, but you know, I think we have to look at the resource. We have to make sure that we have enough for future generations. And, uh, you know, I think we can try a larger minimum size. I don't know, I've tried maybe a seven pounds minimum size and see how that works out. But I think it needs to be not just uh, yellowfin, but it needs to be big eye also because when they're that size, it's very difficult for, for us to tell, for the enforcement people to tell, you know, which is a yellowfin, which is a big eye. Commercial fishing community on Maui, they'll be affected pretty heavily because 
they they have a lot of people that sell fish on the side of the road. You know, it's a pedaling style. It's going to affect the community a little bit, you know, because what it is now is, you know, they, they can go out and buy a roadside fish or, you know, generally under $20, you know. I mean, and then you're going to, if it, if it raises to 10 pounds, it's going to be generally about $30, $30 or so, you know. But, you know, where do we draw the line? You know, where do we draw the line? Are, are we going to take fish for today and no fish for tomorrow? You know, so supporting the, the actual minimum size is actually, I think, for Hawaii and Hawaii's future of fishing and even consuming fish, it's it's to the better that they do raise the, the size limit for sure. What David's work has shown is that with a relatively modest increase in minimum size, would put the fish at a period of its life history where its natural mortality rate is at its lowest. And so if fish landed above that minimum size, one would expect more of the specimens to reach maturity. If we say had a, a larger minimum size, the trade-off would be some people would be disadvantaged from being able to land small yellowfin. How big is that community? Even if it's small, what aspects of that community make it vulnerable? Maybe it's like 10% of the population, but it might also be that it's 90% uh, of all the poor people or below a certain income level. So, you know, it, you, you have to be able to describe those impacts. Some fishermen are absolutely willing to leave the smaller ones in the water for um, a, a, a chance at catching larger fish over a longer period of time. We had the, the retailers who are concerned about not having the small fish for a group of consumers who like that fish that can fit in the frying pan. Similarly, the most recent assessments for yellowfin indicate that it is not being overfished and is not in an overfished state, but it's probably pretty close to the level of population size that can produce the maximum sustainable yield. And so there is concern about it not being overfished in the future and there are close attention being paid to it and its stock assessment to try and make sure that we stay on the good side of the thresholds of overfishing and overfished. The initial assumption was tuna was a pelagic species, just like marlin, you know, and everything else, just migrating a Pacific Y. And then now, we're getting better science that's saying, oh, maybe not so. Yes, big eye tuna kind of make the room all over the Pacific. But yellowfin have this affinity of staying close to home. And that's our EZ. So it's it's kind of like our fish, right? In, in a, a Hawaii EZ 200 miles. So we need to be better kept in place on that resource. Respect is encouraging the state of Hawaii to take a look at its minimum size right now and looking at raising it to a higher um, weight limit. The smaller tuna, if allowed to go to a larger size, when they get to about that 12 to 16 pound range, um, if they're allowed to survive in greater numbers, grow much quicker at that point. So the benefit to the fishermen by leaving those smaller tunas out there, rather than catching them or selling them, is that you will have theoretically a larger number of fish after a certain period of time in the larger class range, which is the more desirable class range for um, sale for um, poke markets and sushi markets. So that, that is the benefit. If, and if we can convince fishermen that it's in their best interest to not catch large numbers of small yellowfin tuna in Hawaii, which the science shows are born and sort of stay around the waters of Hawaii. So it's a stock that we really should manage because we're responsible for our own and our children's futures when it comes to yellowfin tuna. If we observe a little bit of more restraint, um, the fishery will improve in the long run and become much more sustainable. Discussing it with uh, people in the fishing community right now, we think it's a good idea. Um, so we are pursuing the discussions to see what kind of um, pushback or what kind of concerns fishermen or again the retailers um, would would put forward. What has intrigued me is that because of what we now know about yellowfin in Hawaii, it seems that 
do have a somewhat um, local population. And in that respect, anything you can do to enhance it, that population will remain with you. It's not going to go to Mexico. It's not going to go somewhere else. That raises the possibility of local scale management. And I think that's a really powerful concept. A concept that people in Hawaiian fishermen can take to heart because I don't really believe in regulating them with laws as much as trying to put forth this idea of self-enforcing the incorporation of what we call best practices in fishing, like funnel fishing. Yellowfin is healthy. We think that this is a wonderful fishery to pursue because it's still healthy and you know we can all decide how it should be managed. Perhaps we need to change what the size for commercial catch is. Because the scientists have found that we have our own resident population, you know, we should manage our own fisheries and, and we don't need to have countries or the federal government or the large commissions making decisions way out there. We make our own decisions here. So I've been doing it for 65 years, yeah. And, and the challenge, being out there with friends, you know, and, and just, just the notion of fishing is, is, is um, in, inherent. It, you know, I was born with it, I guess, in, in, inside of me. And, and the guys that fish, you know, they, they're going to go fishing no matter what, whether it's shoreline, diving, pulling line, or hand line, whatever. We're going to do it because it, it is just inherent and embedded in us. And tradition, heritage, culture, yeah, all of those things play in. So fishing is, is who we are. And, and you know, hard to take that away from us, yeah. We should protect our resources for our people. We should make sure that they are sustainable. But we, we want to look ahead, you know, preparing for the future. say that this is obviously uh, uh, it can be a divisive issue uh, in the community you heard some different perspectives um, from uh, the scientists themselves from the uh, managers and from the retail markets there are certain people that really have been born and raised and rely on the smaller ahi and uh, there are some people that um, want to see the minimum size uh, you know increased and there are some that don't and so as Paul Dalsell said, it's it's important to understand all of those perspectives and potential impacts and factor them into the, the ultimate decision that not just the federal government has to make, this is a fishery management, the West Pacific Fishery Management Council, but also the state. You know, the, the state has to, we have to do this in coordination with the state who have, who have the current three pound minimum size limit and, you know, there is no federal rule at all. And so if we enact a federal rule, we'll, we'll want to do it in concert with anything that the state does. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions um, here in the audience or uh, coming from online. Okay, it's, it's difficult to understand and, and really embrace sustainability because to me, the, the stock is overfished. And so how do, you, how do you control the take, you know? Um, so when you say to you the stock is overfished, what, what are you basing that uh, perception or that belief on? I might be wrong, but I think that if you look at the economic gauge of just price, mm -hmm. it would suggest to me that the stock is overfished. So from what the, the biophysical science is showing, 
Uh, we are up around that part that overfishing could occur if we get a real a, a lot more entrance into the fishery and a lot more people catching a lot more fish but right now we believe we're kind of at, in that sweet spot so to speak that we've got sort of the right amount of effort with the right amount of fish coming into the population being born and surviving to adulthood to spawn and so we think we're good there um, in terms of the, the price uh, certainly the smaller fish are the, are, are the cheaper ones I mean you, you tend to see 395 or so 295 to 395 a pound for the for the small um, small fish the small whole yellowfin in the market and that, that is something that is very desirable for folks who don't have a lot of cash in their pocket um, you know the bigger they get the more they have to be filleted up and then you get into depending on your grade um, something I think I, Thomas Shears yesterday was 795 a pound for good grade up to oh I think I paid 14 or 1695 a pound for high grade and then you, you get beyond that with your big your big eye and, and things like that but in terms of yellowfin and so um, I don't know in terms of how much um, what the price data shows right now in terms of being able to connect the price data in the markets with uh, you know how much the, the, the how much pressure is on the stock if there's any overfishing going on I think during the summer when you've got a lot coming in you're gonna have a lower price per pound and when in you know in this time of year in the winter time and coming into the spring it's gonna be a little more expensive because you don't have as much in the markets but historically, if you were to look at maybe numbers of large fish over the years, would you say that the numbers of large fish have dropped? I don't know the answer to that personally. I'd be happy to 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 find out and look at the look at the um, the size data over the years. And you've got to remember too that if you're looking at the number of large fish, and what are we talking about large? I'm not sure, but uh, the auction, it gives you some pretty good long-term trends from the long line fishery. Now, a lot of the tuna that we're talking about, the elephant we're talking about in this video, comes more from the local guys in the smaller boats, the, basically the offshore troll fisheries. Um, those are not long line boats. Those are, those are trollers. And some of them are commercial and some of them are sort of part-time commercial and some of those are opportunistically commercial. They'll sell a little bit of extra uh, to pay for, for fuel and, and bait and ice, but they're otherwise non-commercial fishermen. And so you're going to have sort of some different data coming in. If you're looking at long line fish, they're not going to be selling the small guys. If you're looking at, um, you know, the, the pelagic troll, they're going to be probably, you may have a bias towards some of the small fish because, you know, out markets out in Waianae and elsewhere, even in Chinatown, they're looking for the small fish. And so it's hard to sometimes to you got to know what you're doing to tease out the signals of um, of size in the market and what that means over over time because there's sometimes a bias or a preference for delivering the small fish. We see this in reef fish all the time. Um, you go to the markets and you see small you see small reef fish and you think, oh my gosh, you know the the size of the fish in the market is getting really really manini when in fact. It could be a timing issue. You need to get sometimes you need to get to the market really early because there's still a lot of big fish coming in, but they've been sold, and all that's left is the small guys that other people don't want. And so you've got to understand that the timing when you get to the market on a certain day or certain seasons, or whether you're at the auction or you're at a, a mom and pop fish market in Waianae, you have to understand that to really be able to tease out any signal that you might be looking for that the size is indicating something about the stock. But I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying it's just, you know, I have to, you have to take in certain factors because sometimes people say, oh, just look at the size. Go, go on any day to a market and look at the size. And that's not sometimes a very good indicator of what is going on in a fishery right now. That might be an indicator of what time of day you got there. <laughs> yeah, I was almost going to say that. You go to the market and look, the fish nowadays tend to be small. I mean, but overall, they tend to be small. Yeah, there, there are certain fisheries, you know, we look at, for example, Cross Seamount. And if you're familiar with the Cross Seamount, but it's about 140 miles southwest of the Big Island. Um, and some recent data is suggesting that the average uh, weight of the fish being landed now is a little bit smaller than it has been in the, in the past. So you definitely can, you can look at those data and, and understand something about what's going on in the fishery. but. They have to be evaluated in the context of other factors sometimes to really make sure that you understand. But yeah, 
Sustainability is a tough, a tough. You know, there's a hundred different definitions of it depending on who you are and what your, you know, what your agenda might be, or um, you know, what what particular parts of the sustainability puzzle you're looking at. Um, it is not cut and dry. Generally, I think most people say, at what level of fishing or hunting or whatever can we can we can we conduct or engage in and still have animals to fish and hunt that are of sufficient size and, and to be able to breed down the line. That's kind of a basic thing. But there are other parts of sustainability in terms of uh, impacts to the environment, especially on the land side, that go into it. It's not just the thing that you're hunting or fishing for. It's how you're doing it and what impacts you're having on other parts of the ecosystem. And so there's a lot of other factors that go into it, just beyond pointing at that one thing that you're focused on. Well, of course, uh, looking at stock, the ocean is like an invisible closet. I mean, you don't know what you got, right? And so, given that, you don't know where you are in, the, in this game. It's it's very true. I you know I'm a social scientist, and so I, I have a lot of biologists often kind of um, they they have issues with sort of some of the so the methodology and statistics and analysis that a lot of us social scientists do. But they have to point out to them the the ocean's a big place where you just have to do a lot of guessing at how much is in there. And not to disparage the, the biophysical science so much, but it's you know um, there are uh, there's some haziness around all scientific. <laughs> Um, you know, endeavors and, and the ocean, it, it is tough. I, you know, we envy the foresters, right? They can go into a forest, they can delineate a one mile square area and count every single tree and species of tree in there and know exactly down to the, you know, to the sapling what's going on. Not so in fisheries. And so you get into these situations and you see it in New England um, where all of a sudden you got a 77% reduction in the amount of cod that the fishermen can catch when the year before things were looking okay and all of a sudden there's sort of new evidence or a new uh, way to analyze reanalyze the data um and all of a sudden things aren't okay and so i think that that precautionary approach um and making sure that you have padding and that's why you know with the annual catch limits that we set now are required to set by the magnus and stevens act the controlling fishery act for federal waters um it's not just what's out there so how much can we fish it is, it's what's out there and then there are a number of different slices they take off of that to get down to what we can fish because we've got scientific uncertainty and management uncertainty and we've got potentially issues going on with different groups of people who are catching the fish and so we want to make sure so in the Gulf of Mexico you've got all these states and all these different sectors that are catching um, red snapper and so it's important to factor in that and so there's all of these cuts that get taken off and some of them are insubstantial they're, 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 they're fairly substantial cuts to get down to how much can we fish and you know the fishermen might look and say well there you, you guys said there's this much fish out there we, we can take more well the law requires us to 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 not do that to to take a bunch of precaution off and then set a limit so what we're trying to do is 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 um manage for the fact that we know we don't know a lot about the stock and we're, it's never going to be perfect but we don't want to go and have next year have to take 77 percent of the catch away from fishermen because we screwed up on something well, well still it defies logic because if you look at the biology of the fish to suggest that it's okay to take like a three pound fish and yet the fish is not Essentially, even tour right cannot produce, and yet you take it. Yeah, you know, and as the video said, that that's a it was an interesting way that that three pound limit came about. I think if you talk to most fishery biologists, and from a purely biophysical standpoint, a life history standpoint, you'd want to set your limit much higher. Okay. You'd want to set your limit somewhere around that forty four inches or more. Um, so that you get, a, 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 you know, right now at three pounds, there's no sexual maturity there. They're not reproducing at all. Um, so the, the, the higher the limit, the more and more and more parts of the population, percentage of the population is, is uh, reproducing or is able to reproduce. And that's sort of the, the, the biological science sort of examination of it. And it's very cut and dry. How, you know, at what, percent, at, at what length or weight is 50% of the species able to reproduce? Well, there's your, there's your target for commercial sale or even non-commercial 
retention. Um, but you've got to, you know, that doesn't, it, you know, if, if, if biology was the holy grail, then, you know, we probably just lock up Panama Bay and move on because you know, biology would show that it's not sustainable for all of these people or not, I shouldn't say sustainable. The impacts for all these people out there are, um, you know, not what the biologists would want to see. So you've got all of these other things that the law requires us to take into account as well. And you've got the legislative process, as William Isla said. And so there are these compromises that sometimes you have to make uh, in the short term. And so one thing I think that's helping the, the yellow fin stock, and you heard this in the video, is that they're really fast growers and they get to sexual maturity faster than other species. And mahi-mahi are another one too that, that make them fairly sustainable. And so even though three pounds is not a sexually mature fish um, in terms of yellowfin, uh, the fact that a lot of them, um, fishing is, a, is a, it, responsible for a very small part of the mortality of these fish. There's other things in nature uh, that kill gr much greater amounts of yellowfin than fishermen do. And so the fact that they're able to reproduce in such great numbers and get there so quick, even with that three pound limit and even with the fishing that's going on, they're able to maintain. But now that we know that we've probably got, and I say probably, we've probably got um, more of a, a local stock here in the Hawaiian Islands, do we want to take chances? You know, how much of a risk do we want to take that something isn't going to happen to upset that balance where fishing mortality all of a sudden becomes a bigger concern um, or there may be a, a bigger uh, natural mortality issue that's introduced and sort of the death by a thousand cuts. And so do we want to take a look at increasing the minimum size for commercial? And we've heard this as well from the community. Do we want to institute maybe a complementary non-commercial size limit that enforcement out on the water or you know when you bring your boat into the harbor can take a look and you've got any anything any re, any retention at all less than a certain pound that's something we heard from the commercial guys too is that if you're serious about this as an issue make it across the board don't just make it for commercial sale make it for all retention and so we've heard that too um so that's kind of the question really and the answer de depends a lot on at, you know at what level is it going to be socially acceptable for us to to raise a limit to without you know, really impacting certain folks um, who we really want to not impact. We don't want to impact uh, lower income folks. We don't want to impact, um, uh, you know, more rural residents who really rely on, on this fish. And it, it, it's a very useful size, that three to sort of seven pounds. You can heads for soup and you eat the whole day, a couple of meals there for a family, doesn't go bad in your fridge for a couple of days. So people are very, we, we found in a lot of our interviews that we're doing with, uh, local community members, people are very passionate about keeping sm the ability to have small ahi in the formal markets in the Tomashiro's and the other places. They really want to. I'm not saying it's a, a huge part of the population, but the part of the population that is, um, you know, in favor of keeping the, the commercial size uh, at, the, at or about the level it's at is a very passionate one. And they stand a lot to lose economically and, and socially and culturally. And so we have to, we have to consider that. And so, um, you know, we're in the process, the council and the state of understanding more about the biology of the stock. Um, they're doing these analyses, like what they call um, yield per recruit. So every recruit in the fishery, what, the, what is the yield for that, that fish coming into the fishery later on and trying to understand at what level um, and even if at all, because of the low fishing mortality, uh, at what level, um, a new size, a commercial size or a non-commercial size limit would make the most sense. Uh, and we're not even saying right now that, that um, you know, that we have all of that data. We're, we're, we're work, working towards it. Um, but we do want to, to, this is an area where the council really does want to be a good steward of what is potentially a real, a much more local stock than we thought it was. And so fishery managers and fishery management councils, you know, from their commercial uh, backgrounds, you know, we used to be the, the National Fishery Service used to be the Bureau of Commercial Fisheries and, and largely the, the, the fishery service was established to promote um, um, domestic fisheries and fishing. Uh, so we're often painted with this sort of catch them and kill them, and all, kill them all uh, sort of branding. And I think that it's probably the furthest thing from the truth. And a lot of the fishery councils, a lot of the issues that we're dealing with, and this is one of them. It's we're, you know, we're, we're actively engaging communities of people who do not want to see any change and may have not wanted to see the three pound minimum size limit in the first place. 
and we're actively engaging them with some of this information to try to see what the next steps might be. But still, it sort of defies logic because I'm sure that the lifespan of the elephant is probably just guessing, maybe like 50 years or so. I think it's. I think yellowfin are less than that. Less than that. I know the uh, the skipjacks are are much less than that, and so I think the yellowfin is is somewhere between. You know, I, I don't want to say a number because I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it's probably most of them are less than fifty years. That would be a pretty long lived fish. These guys are high movers, fast movers. You know, those fast fish, those slow growing old fish are the ones that live deeper in the cold waters and they don't have to move much. That's why their flesh is so tender and yummy, like the cod. Um, but these uh, these fast movers, they tend to, you know, uh, what is it, live fast and die fast. So well, still, I think they have a lifespan. Let's say, say it's twenty five. Okay. Well, and if we take start taking them at three years of age, there's no chance for growth. You know, it's just I'm sure their peak producing years. Yeah. Are somewhere maybe let's say it's ten. Ten years of age. So. You know, it's still we're taking that far. And, and now you're at the heart of the thorny fishery management issues that decisions we have to make because, like I said, if it was all about the biology, you wouldn't have to do a whole lot of work. You'd just have to understand the life history, and that would suggest. And for for species that are endangered or species that are well, you can't even catch those. But species that there's a real concern about going, uh, you know, be in an overfish or overfishing state. You, you tend to rely on the biology and those questions much more, the answers to those questions much more in the, in the determination of what you should do. You know, but again, if, if it's only a question of at what point are you talking about maximum fecundity, maximum reproduction, and you're right, it's that maximum reproduction is, is going to be you know, higher. We're, for 44 inches, that's that 50%. And every year a fish beyond that two and a half or three years is allowed to grow, up to a certain point, they're going to have more and healthier eggs and stronger eggs, I should say. And that's that's what you want in a, in a, in a healthy fishery. But then the question is, can will we be able to catch any at all? You know, if we're if we're only letting them grow to you know these big you know monster uh, you know 300, two, 300 pounds is what we we can catch. Then you're going to really effectively cut out most of your your fishery at all, and maybe unnecessarily. Uh, and that's the thing is we're trying to balance the, the, the biological and ecological needs of the fish with the social needs of people in terms of eating the fish. And if we can compromise, and that's what we have to do with all of these things. You know, do you want a stock that was the way it was pre-contact, you know, before Cook got here? Do you want that stock? Well, we can do that. But do you want to be able to eat yellowfin? Oh, you do? Oh, well, we can't do that then. We've got to do something in between. And it's that in-between that we need to figure out is the best choice to make sure the fish are still there in the future and the best choice to make sure that the maximum amount and, and, and different types of communities here in Hawaii can enjoy the fish. And it, it, I'm, it is a challenging enterprise. It is not easy. And, and uh, you're going to have people, you know, they often say if you're doing it right, everybody hates you. So <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> kind of where we're at with it. But, no, you're absolutely right. I don't, I don't think anybody would disagree with you that, that letting them grow uh, equals more eggs and stronger eggs uh, in the fishery. But to the extent that, that, that we need all of those eggs and all of those strong eggs to maintain a fishery at some level, that's, that's where we have to make some decisions. Now in your film, a lot of your footage appears to me that you have, it's a caged or it's not shot in the wild. I think a lot of those pictures, if I'm if I if I understand correctly, are from um, purse seine nets. So they're they're in the wild, but they've been corralled, and it's before the net is hauled on to the big purse seine boats. The divers get in. Sometimes they're really they're counting sharks or releasing whatever. They're in there and they're filming, and they, so they're able to get you know the fish are in a big ball like that, and that's how they're able to get the fish. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that is where some of those shots come from. Yeah, no. The cage is the cage. Uh, the aquaculture stuff for for some of the species is, is coming along for some of the pelagic species, but you know we're at the infancy of of understanding what to what how much it's going to cost and what it's going to take to make those fish um, economically viable. So, in the cage. so with the elephant, we haven't gotten close to 
firing? I don't. I don't believe so. I haven't heard of uh, any any. I've heard of test. I think some some tests here in the Pacific. I don't know if it was yellowfin, but where they put tuna in these free ranging cages, they'll let it go. It might be thirty or forty feet down. They'll put a satellite tracker on it, and it'll it'll they'll just let it go, and they'll right. they'll pick it up three thousand miles. But it's only those only been. I think I read that in a magazine somewhere that and it's only a test at this point. Some of the aquaculture that's going on in the Big Island are Kampachi and some other things, not necessarily ahi. Um, to my knowledge, but I, I could be wrong. There's other. There's a lot of little startups that are little test pilot tests that are going on just to see how well these things fare and how much we have to feed them and how much they grow and and other limitations. Hawaii is kind of good. We got really deep oceans. We're not going to have probably some of the the impacts that they have with farm tuna or excuse me farm salmon um, on both coasts where you've got shallower water and you've got a lot of issues with some of the bottom habitat being affected and you've got sea lice and you've got all these other antibiotic issues you know if the, if your water depth is in the thousands of feet versus the tens or feet uh, you're gonna have m much less uh, direct impacts from from aquaculture but that's a whole other <laughs> that's a whole other discussion okay. uh, I have a question yeah so when you are managing um, actually, I actually have two questions one, if we're catching fish and they're at a smaller rate, smaller size, they're reproduce they're if it's like I'm thinking about like how natural selection affects them. Mm -hmm. Like if you're taking so much um, of these young ones, will we have smaller fish as time go uh, as time goes on? Is that how it works? Maybe not. No, nope, that can be the case. I mean, if you're if you're if you're we're, removing fish from the population, you're the removing the breeders will be left, right? Because so that's yeah. That's so okay, that's your question. So nature abhors a vacuum, right? And so for some species, we find that um, there, there's actually a sort of a, a, an evolutionary effect almost. There's a response effect for some species from fishing and when you're removing parts of the population, you are finding that um, you're, you're now creating sort of a, a, a vacuum a bit, and you're finding that there may be some difference is in, in, in breeding and you know, fecundity and other rates um, over time with the, speed, with the fish that are left to kind of, they sense it. They, they seem to be able to sense it. I'm not the expert on, on all of these, this biophysical part, but from what I understand, there are some species that we have observed a response effect in in the breeding, um, you know, the spawning, I should say, of the species um, that is probably a direct effect to the, the removal via fishing or other mortality in the in the in the in the stock. And so it is interesting to understand that. But really, you know, it is about it really is about eggs. Managing fish can be really about eggs in some of these species. You want as many eggs and as healthy eggs as possible. Um, given certain constraints, like needing to eat them. <laughs> so we have to make these balancing decisions. And um, secondly, when, when like for a three pounders, is there a way to like manage like just, you can only take so many of these fish or is it like you only can set the limit on weight specifically? Can you not put a, a bag limit or something on them? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you can do almost anything. Um, right now, we don't have that. Uh, and right now, the, the size restriction, the size limit is, is only on commercial sale. And so you could go out there tomorrow and you can catch as many half pound, one pound, whatever, yellow fin that you want to. Um, as long as you're not, you know, selling them, you can, you can do whatever you want. And you can sell as many three pounders as you want as well. There's no, there's no limit. Now, whether there should be a limit, on a bag limit on them, a non-commercial bag limit and a, you know, and a commercial bag limit, that, that is a question. And it's one that we're, we're being asked. Um, it would solve some problems, I think, and, and cause some others. We, we don't have a huge law enforcement capacity, right? I think Don't Care has 100 officers, and they're around the state, and they've got water and land to deal with, and some of them are sick or on vacation at any one time, so it's not like we have 100 at any one time. So, um, you know, you know that sort of thing. You know, just saying everybody has to adhere to a certain number of three pounders, whether you're commercial or not, and you know, checking pollution. It's absolutely something that can happen. 
um, whether or not we want it to happen, whether or not society wants it to happen, that's the big question. And so, you know, sometimes ideas are things that just, you know, you've heard the, the, the term, it's an idea whose time has come. That may not be an idea whose time has come. <laughs> you may have to do certain things in the interim. But the important thing, I think, is to keep collecting the biology and the, the biological data and the social data and the economic data to understand um, all of the trade-offs that are inherent in this decision. But it's something, to, in response to your question, absolutely, something we could do. We can do almost anything. <laughs>